I keep trying to remember the first time that I saw it. I think it was sometime in the 1970s, and it may have been at what is now Wellspring Church in Pacific Grove, or perhaps somewhere on the campus of Mount Hermon up in Scotts Valley. What does stick in my mind is that it was this rough piece of wood that had a machine-carved but hand-painted word in it. And the word was koinonia. Now, anybody that knows me very well knows that I love words. I, they just fascinate me. I love to study them and kind of know a little bit of the history. And I just don't recall at the time being particularly intrigued by the word or even interested in determining what it meant. And I will tell you, at that present time, I had no idea what a koinonia was or what a koinonia did. Or perhaps it was some Old Testament character that I was unaware of that people chose to use to name buildings after. I just didn't know. Until about a decade and a half later, in my 30s, I went to Bethany Bible College in Scotts Valley, and it might have been in an introductory Greek class, it might have been in a study of the book of Acts, where I found out what koinonia meant. <laughs> it, okay, well, the word koinonia is found all through the New Testament record. And in its verb form, it's most often rendered as the word share. As a noun, it's translated in several different ways. It can mean contribution. It can mean share. It can mean partnership. It can mean participation. But most often, it's translated as the word fellowship. And as you explore the word, it's just really kind of interesting. It has both the sense of sharing with and sharing in something. And there's this very real sense that this is a spiritual component in our sharing that is enhanced by the Holy Spirit and indeed increases our relationship with him. It's really a very rich word. Well, we're in week six of this Forgotten Art series and in week one, my brother, Pastor Dennis, he talked us through the forgotten art of listening. I hope you heard that one. Week two, Pastor Kevin talked about the forgotten art of forgiveness. Week three, he talked about the forgotten art of acceptance. And then in week four, he talked about the forgotten art of blessing. And last week, the forgotten art of hard work. And today, in week six, we're going to talk about the forgotten art of fellowship. Now, I want to start by looking at what did God have in mind for this thing called fellowship? What was the master's plan? And just like Pastor Dennis did with our giving back time, we want to turn to the words of the master to see what he had in mind. But before I look at that specific verse, I want to pay attention to what Jesus said as he was ready to depart. We find at the end of Matthew's gospel, that first book in the New Testament, the very end, he's getting ready to depart and go to the right hand of the Father, and he says, you go and make disciples, followers of me, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded. Jesus' words. And then when we get to the Gospel of John, and we're about middle way through there, all of a sudden, we get this time where Jesus is with his closest chosen ones, and in that, he gives them a new command. Yeah, Jesus sets the bar for our attitudes and for our actions, one with another, who are in, within his fellowship, his fraternity of followers. This is how John records the words of Jesus in this Gospel record. He says, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. 
everyone will know that you are my disciples. Little tiny word. So big. If you love one another. New marching orders. As his followers, we are to love one another. Specifically, as Jesus demonstrated his love upon us, so should our love be. And he said that if we will love like that, that people will recognize that we are his. So I want to explore this morning for a little while, what did that look like, this loving one another in the early church, and can we learn something in there for ourselves? So let's take a look at that forgotten art. And what I want to do in, in the next few moments is we're going to spend some time in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 6. So if you want to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, open your Bible app to Acts chapter 2, we are going to start at the end of that chapter 2 in the book of Acts. Because by the time we get there, we see that the fledgling church community that is in Jerusalem is working very hard to fulfill Jesus' command to love one another. This is how it looked. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And I just kind of an aside here, they devoted, it says on the screen up there, it says they continually devoted themselves. That's the way the word unpacks if you were to dig into it. So continually, they were coming together, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fact of just being together. More on that later. But to the breaking of bread and also prayer. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs of the apostles. Now, the apostles have been supernaturally equipped. We'll see at the beginning of chapter 2, but in a, in a little bit, we'll back up there. And they are expressing the mercy, the grace, the love, the power of Jesus in the presence of this new community. Verse 44. All the believers were together. And they were assembled, yes. But they were of one mind and one heart. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They were open-handed with their stuff and with life. Verse 45 unpacks that. It says, they sold properties and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So this was not an introspective faith. They were looking outside of themselves and they were looking to see where are the needs and how do we meet them? Pastor Dennis, thanks for that giving back time when we can understand that that is part of what we do as a church is we look not only within our community but also outside our borders and where are the needs and how do we fill those? And this church was setting that example. Verse 46, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Now, their temple courts were our Shoreline Worship Center. Same thing. They were gathering together as a large group. But then what did they do? They broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So they had large group coming together, and they had home groups, smaller units coming together, sharing a meal, having conversation, unpacking this stuff, growing one another side by side. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And then, this was an attractional place. It says that the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. But a high quality marker of what we see in that little passage there is that the Jerusalem church cared. They were intentional about their caring one for another. And then if we turn the page and we look at the end of chapter 4, we find something that is fairly similar, but there's a couple of things I'd love to point out to you. All the believers, now it puts it clearly, all the believers, verse 32, were one in heart and in mind. And again, that open-handed thing, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Verse 33, 
Oh, I love this line. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And that, just always when I read that line, it makes me think of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul leaning into that church and he's saying, what I learned, I'm passing on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sin. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And he kept honing in on that. And the apostles did too. With power and strength and, and, and determination and diligence, they kept hitting that message. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money and from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The church took loving one another to heart. And this Jerusalem church community was really setting the standard for a faith community and intentional fellowship one with another, at least the way God had in mind that it would be. And that fellowship is the forgotten art to a degree that we're exploring today. So I'm going to recap. What did this fellowship look like? Well, if we look back through that text, we see that it was gathering together. They were learning together. They were praying together. They were sharing one with another as they saw need. They were worshiping together just like we did through uh, Cole's guidance and leading through a time of, of worship and song. This church was action-oriented. This church was joyful. And as we read in that, this church was attractional. People couldn't stay away. And I think in short, we could just say that this was a church that cared. And if the Jerusalem church had a phrase or a motto, I think it would be the Jerusalem church cares. But then we get to chapter 6. And things begin to get a bit sticky. Verse 1 in chapter 6 says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, this attractional church... The Hellenistic Jews, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows, the Hellenistic Jews, their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. There was friction at the food pantry. Now, what's going on here? What's really happening? What's behind that? What's underneath that's ruffling the feathers here that's causing a crack in the koinonia. Well, we're going to turn back to chapter 2 again, but now to the very first part of it, and get a sense of what's taking place. And chapter 2 opens with these words. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, the disciples. They were all together in the apostles. We're all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then verse 5 says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Well, that's a pretty exciting thing. The, the apostles are gathered together and they're saying there's, there's this mighty wind and, and the spirit comes and lands on them and they're empowered and equipped and man, it's so easy for us to rush right into that that we forget the opening line of that. It says, on the day of Pentecost. So let's unpack that part. See, Pentecost was this high holy day and we, we read in verse 5 that, that there were, there were there were Yahweh followers from nations scattered about. They were there as part of a pilgrimage festival. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, you can read about that. You can read about it in Exodus 2. There are a couple of two or three different places where it's unpacked what this is. But essentially, Pentecost was a pilgrimage festival where anyone who was a disciple or a follower of Yahweh, the one true God of Israel, their requirement as an adult male 
was to be present on that high holy day wherever it was that God resided. Now, this was established way back in the days of the tabernacle, but here we are, temple time. God resides in the temple, and this is where people would come to gather to celebrate this pilgrimage festival. Well, there are people from all kinds of lands coming together. Now, there are some discrepancies over what the actual number was, what the actual count of the number of people in Jerusalem at that time. But I think probably one of the, the common denominators of what people uh, guesstimate is that Jerusalem, during that period, was, had those who were regular residents, about 30,000 people who lived in that immediate vicinity. On those high holy days, those three festivals, it could swell by three or four times. So we're talking 120, 90 to 120 people who are in Jerusalem during that time. Uh, kind of like Car Week on the Monterey Peninsula. Okay? So you just got to envision that. All these people have gathered, and you have everyone here in the temple courts, and Peter stands up and he proclaims to those gathered that the the news that Messiah had come and that he had made provision for them all, those who accepted that word and accepted Jesus as Lord and were baptized, some 3,000 in number, included those who were both Jerusalem Jews and those who had come from other lands. That gives us a sense of what the makeup of this church is. Because they stayed. They didn't, some of them went back to their homelands. Many of them stayed. Also, there are a group, we got to look at this thing here, one more thing. It's very probable, in fact, has to be the case, that for there to be Hellenistic widows and Hebraic widows in conflict, that there were Hellenistic widows that had come into Jerusalem towards their waning days, so that at the end of their days, they could be buried on the hillside below the Mount of Olives, which was the desire of all, just across the valley from the temple. That would explain that we've got Hellenistic widows and Hebraic widows battling over food. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, as a committed, fledgingly church trying to love one another, there just appears to be a little bit of hometown helpfulness in all this, and some people are being served a little better than others are. They're practicing hospitality, but it seemed that some received a bit more attention than others did. And that attention led to tension. But it was not the last time that there would be tension in the church. Time and again, the Apostle Paul speaks into unraveling situations within the church. And I think we can start with, and we'll just take a look at a couple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, shortly before he made that comment, in chapter 15, and he says, "Look, listen to these words. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Next, further, chapter, uh, verse 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Well, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? Just this little passage here gives us an idea that it's easy for the wheels of the fellowship wagon to fall off. And I got to tell you, you and I are not exempt two millennia later. Well, if you have just any potluck experience, whether it's church-wise or otherwise, there's probably someone in that gathering that has the same mindset that I carried for a long time. There are the quick, and there are the hungry. I'm not going to be the hungry one, so I'm always got to be front in line. My taste buds would drive my temperament in that. But there are plenty of things that we can get into that 
take away from our healthy koinonia. And I want to touch on four of them just briefly here. See if any of these resonate with you, if you can relate to these. The first one is disruptions. And I think we can all agree without any, without any disagreement whatsoever that in this era of our COVID conundrum, this has been a great disruptor for the church. We fought hard to put the courtyard together over a year ago so that we could gather out there safely. We fought hard to make the worship center a, a safe place for you. Return back in here as you began to feel comfortable and various things took place that allowed for that to happen. We fought hard to stay online with uh, relevant and appropriate technology to allow you to safely feel like you need to stay at home but still be engaged with your church family. But it's still been a great disruption. But there are other things that are disruptors as well. I mean, we get caught up in all kinds of stuff that take us away just for a little bit. And then we find it hard to get back in the groove. It seems like seemingly insignificant disruptions alter our routines, and it's so hard to get back on track. And then we have distractions. My distraction is no farther than the end of my arm my cell phone. You probably don't have that problem. I'm sure you don't. But our technology, which is so wonderfully convenient, is so wildly counterproductive in anything from our quiet time to our quality time with one another. And I got to tell you, when my phone opens up in the morning and it flashes that little use time from the day before, I'm I just dread seeing it, but it does remind me that I need to change things. You probably don't have that problem. But I will tell you that the next time you're out to dinner, if you'll put yours aside just long enough to look around at the other tables in the restaurant, you'll notice that everybody else is doing exactly the same. Couples are sitting across from each other dialoguing with somebody that's not there. And they're both doing that together. <laughs> but distractions get in our way of healthy koinonia. And then we have disagreements. And Pastor Kevin has touched on this on a number of occasions in the last month. This is nothing new to any of us. What is it that we find it so difficult to disagree agreeably? It seems like any difference becomes a deterrent to our dialogue and it just leads to divisions. And then there are deceptions. But I do have one thing we can agree on before we get to that. Can we agree that Jesus Christ is Lord and that the Lord has instructed us to love one another? <laughs> Thank you. But we still have some deceptions that get in the way of that. A generation ago, I could have simply said the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it would have been easily understood that the world has plans for me that do not match God's design and desire for me. We would have readily agreed and understood that we are our own biggest enemy to a healthy and vibrant faith walk. And we certainly would have understood and there would have been clear consensus that the devil delights in putting a dent in our personal faith walk and in our fellowship together. And that whole potluck thing, the quick and the hungry, it was a clear indicator that I was more invested in me than anyone else. And we deceive ourselves. But there is good news. How do we reclaim God's good gifts. All through the New Testament, we see that there are strategies and there are suggestions on how we ratify our ragged edges. And to the challenge of the hungry widows that were in chapter 6, verse 2 unpacks that for us and we can find out what it says in there and I think there's some great stuff that we can learn. The 12 gathered all the disciples together and they said, 
hey, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal, verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole group. The apostles knew their lane, and I knew the value of staying in their lane. And that's what they did. But they also knew the viability and the total value of all the other things that were happening to develop koinonia, fellowship, within that body. And so they handed off those responsibilities so that they could stay in their lane as God had called them to and allowed others open-handedly to be able to take things and run with them, things that were also important. By the way, if you continue in verse 5, there are seven names selected there. They are all Greek names. And I think that's rather interesting that those Greek names those Hellenistic Jews who were complaining now had a consortium that were speaking on their behalf that were working in the food pantry, if you will. Well, can I tell you, as a 13-year member of this staff, I feel like Shoreline operates in a very similar paradigm. I don't think we're radically different than that. We have a lead pastor in Pastor Kevin Harney. Uh, we have an executive team. They speak into the operational endeavors of Shoreline Church. We have a leadership team who see to the fiscal health of your church. And we have staff who guide and direct ministries and volunteers to see that both the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews get fed. And I'll tell you that in all the time I've been here, and especially in the 10 years when I oversaw specifically children's ministry, not once did Kevin come in to tell me and says, you need to do that. This is what you need to be about. It was never about that. He would come and inquire about, is this happening? Could we look at, suggest, explore, examine, discover, as well he should to know what's happening within the body that he's been called to lead? but never as directive. Open-handed, go do that. And what it allowed, and what it does allow, is it allows for Pastor Kevin to make his main thing his main thing. And we're all grateful and fortunate that he does that. Uh, it kind of causes me to ask a question, though. Have you found your lane? in service to your brothers and sisters as part of the fellowship of Shoreline. I would just encourage you to do so. But time and again, we see the Apostle Paul, in his words, in his letters, speaking into issues of fractured fellowship and decades removed from that incident in the book of Acts. But perhaps the most directly were his attempts to give us a broader understanding of the, that love one another mindset of Jesus. And over 30 times in his writing to the church, he addresses some sort of one another living. I can only imagine what it must have been like as he traveled to the churches and he was face to face with them talking about what that needed to look like. But you know, he wasn't alone. Peter, James, John, you go read through their letters to the church. They address one another living as well. It's, it's all in there. If, if you look for it, you'll find it. That little love one another that Jesus commanded, we find it echoed over 11 times in seven New Testament documents. Everybody's leaning in on it. And here's the deal. When I read through the various one another commands, I find it really hard to figure that we can do that if we're not in community. And I came across this article not too long ago that it, it categorized one another passages into three buckets, three broad categories. Humility, unity, and as we would expect, love. 
Well, the first one is humility. And about 15% of the one another passages call for healthy doses of humility in our lives. Here's a couple of them. Galatians 5, uh, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Every time I read that, it makes me think of Shoreline's marker of spiritual maturity, humble service. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Philippians 2, don't do anything out of vain conceit. Instead, consider others better than yourself. Don't look to your own interests. Look to the interests of others. Humility is one of those things, I think, where we need kind of a whack on the side of the head or a little shift in thinking. But C.S. Lewis, decades ago, he made a statement on humility, I think, that will help us to grasp that. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. Well, I got to tell you something. The Pena family here in the area, they're about... 13 of us, I think, that live fairly immediate. And with my brother and his family in the Bay Area, there's another five up there, and my daughter will occasionally come out with her three kids, so add four to that. Sunday evenings is family dinner time. So that could be any number from, if there's just a few of us in town, maybe six or seven around the table to over 20. And week after week after week, my brother Mark, my baby brother, my baby brother would show what humble service was like to his family as we would go through a potluck line, if you will, as we shared our meal together. He was always the last in line. Oh, talk about developing some humility. He wouldn't let me stand behind him, but he'd let me stand right in front of him in that line and get out from the front of the line. I think those are things that we just need to learn to recognize and be able to see. Not just the needs of others, but they're just as important as we are. Unity is that second bucket, and 30% of those fit into that arena called unity. And disunity is something that deals a death blow to our gatherings, and we just we can't afford it. Two verses, Colossians 3.13, bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you have, may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4.32, similarly, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Are you catching a trend in this? Does it point us back to week two when Pastor Kevin was talking about the forgotten art of forgiveness? And then perhaps one of my favorites, Romans chapter 15, verse 5 Kind of a benediction of sorts. This is a New King James Version here, not NIV like we normally read around here. May the God of patience and comfort grant that you be like-minded toward one another. According to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That third bucket is love. A full 30% of them fit into this bucket. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. And I think Ephesians 4, 2, I think it ticks all three of these boxes. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. What are the last words? In love. So how might we foster this thing called fellowship, this forgotten art? How do we develop our artistic abilities in this? How do we stretch ourselves in this regard? And I think it starts with just asking a few questions, a little self-examination. First question might be, what is my measure of humility? Am I able to see the people around me, number one. And number two, am I able to lean into what their needs are? 
Would I even know them? And so having a measure of humility as we walk on the campus and gather together allows us to look outside of ourselves. The second one is what is, uh, do my attitudes and actions foster unity? Are we separate in this or are we together? When I come onto the campus, am I looking about us being gathered together and, and enjoying that fellowship time together or Am I a solo practitioner of my faith? I think Jesus calls us to be together so that in unity, we can rub shoulders one with another and grow together. And then the third question is, am I seen as one who exhibits Jesus' brand of love toward one another? Remember that Jerusalem church motto, Jerusalem church cares? So maybe we could look at it in that regard. That we could ask ourselves this question, does Shoreline care? And four words I'll leave you with. The first one's community. It is very tough to have koinonia or fellowship unless we are gathered. Now, I know that we have those who are at home who are, they're not quite ready to return. Uh, there are underlying issues in that. And we are going to deliver content to you and be part of your community as long as we can, as long as we're able, as long as you're able. But at some point, we want to invite those who can, just like you have today, to come together in community so that we can be together to accomplish three different things. By the way, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, speaks into this community area. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. That needs to be our regular method, our motion. And as I've spoken to some of you who have made your way back here, just of recent, uh, uh, it was post-service. We'd already been together, and we're just kind of chatting afterwards. And it's like this, I did not realize what I was missing, being with my church family. Uh, you know who you are and what that was like when you came back. So we come together in community, and we can do three things. The first one is that we can, we can participate in accountability. Hebrews chapter 3 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Coming into community allows us to, to exercise some accountability, one with another, in regard to our spiritual life and our development. Now, right now, I'm, I'm online with a group of people walking through Shoreline's seven markers of spiritual maturity. And I mentioned in one of our early meetings that uh, I'm a journaler, or I was, and I let them know that I just, that had fallen off the radar in my life, and I really wanted to get back to it, and I asked them to keep me accountable in that. And they have. And I haven't had good answers when they ask if I'm back at it. But I've asked them not to let up, because I need to do it, and then I need to make myself accountable to them. And vice versa. Some of them have things they want to work with, too. The second thing is, is we can experience refinement when we're in community. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Well, that same group of people, they have been such an encouragement to me. I'm learning about them, and I'm learning from them, and we're, 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 we're trading. Uh, as we go through each of the seven markers, we're talking about how did that become a thing in my life and how do I enhance it? How do I keep it sharp? And those who have a marker that's really strong are leaning into those where maybe it's a little less developed and we're sharpening one another. We are refined as we gather together. And then finally, there's encouragement. Back to that Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encouraging one another. So I'm going to ask you, how do we care? Where are we connecting? Who are we allowing into our circle, into our sphere, into our world? How am I growing? Examine that. And then who am I cheering on? I want to propose three short ideas. Just take a minute on how we might better that and enhance our koinonia. 
first of all, if we just look at the last five weeks of our sermon series, if we were, would, would increase our listening, if we would foster forgiveness, if we would administer acceptance to those around us, if we would be ready to speak blessing and be a blessing in the lives of others, and if we would be ready to do all of our endeavors faithfully as we work as for the Lord himself, any one of those would enhance fellowship, increase koinonia. Collectively, it would move us forward in good measure. The second one is that we could just make personally that shoreline cares concept. Adopt that slogan for yourself and let's be biblical as we come together in community, as we gather, be in the habit of being accountable to one another, being refined by one another, encouraging one another every time we gather together. Now, for the third option, I need you to take out your phone. You got it? You got your phones with you? Got mine here in my pocket. It's okay. I got permission from Kevin for us to do this. I want you to open up, I want you to open up your text app. And if you're willing, I'm going to invite you to register to get five emails from me this next week. Each short video is going to give you a little unpacking of one of the other, one another verses. Just through those five days. Uh, some of them I did, some of them Pastor Dennis did. We just want to share those with you and allow you to develop that. It's okay. Go ahead. You can text that now if you're so inclined. I hope you'll take us in on that. And then um, we're looking at ways that we can enhance the dialogue on that, and you'll hear more information on that. But just listening to those may open up some exploration of each of those one another passages. Well, <laughs> there is a fourth way this morning. And I'm sorry, those of you who are online, it's only for those who are here in the worship center. Those are in the courtyard over in the family worship venue. Uh, we've arranged for there to be some fellowship fostering frozen treats. Got it? Otherwise known as koinonia convection, confections. I'll look for another alliteration, but I don't know that I'll find it. When you leave here today, we want you to go outside those doors and out to the courtyard. There's a red tent, and under there is an array of frozen treats, and we want you to grab one of those. And maybe grab two and take one and hand off to someone else. But we want you to engage in some koinonia with your brothers and sisters in the courtyard. That first sign that I saw was a placket outside of a room that said koinonia hall. It was the place where fellowship happened within that church community. Now, we don't have one of those, but we have a koinonia courtyard that between services or after every service, we can engage in fellowship one in another, being in community, and encouraging one another as we grow together in God's mercy and grace. Now, before I offer up a word of blessing and send you out, I have two announcements. First of all, today is Grandparents' Day. And I'm just wondering, are there any grandparents here? We got one, three or four. Okay, we got a handful. Well, in celebration of your lofty position as legacy maker, we've made available a packet of grandparenting resources out at one of the blue tents in the, in the courtyard. But in addition, more importantly, you'll find information on an event that's going to happen here towards the end of October, the Legacy Grandparenting Summit. My good friend Larry Fowler has put together a summit that is designed to celebrate who you are as grandparents but also to help you strategize how best to lean into that second and third generation and develop your legacy of faith. Registration is already open for it. I encourage you to come to register for that and be in attendance with it. It's going to be right here in our, in our place. If you're with us this morning, or even if you're online and you need prayer for anything, Online, there's a number on the screen. Feel free to give that a call. There are people waiting to pray with you online or on the phone. Those who are in the worship center here, a courtyard or family worship venue, right up front after the service, there'll be prayer partners here. I invite you to come up and ask for prayer. And if you're here for the first time, thanks for joining us. Online, you can text welcome after you text one another 
text welcome to that same phone number and they will send you a digital welcome card and we just like to know who you are and we would love to see how we can experience koinonia with you. How do we best serve you? And if you're new here, you're in the worship center, we just allow you, we'd ask that you stop by the connection center and visit somebody on that connection team. They've got a gift for you. And again, we'd just like to welcome you here. We appreciate that. Now, whether you're online, whether you're in the courtyard, and I know there are a lot of you out there today, if you're in the fellowship hall in here, I'd like you to stand as in give you a closing blessing. May the God of all patience and comfort grant that you be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus so that we, all of us, may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go and share in and with the spirit of the living God. God be with you.